Our presenter today is Mohamed Sayar, Senior Consultant and Product Owner with Agile Assets. For nearly 15 years, he has led complex infrastructure asset management projects with a special focus on the inspection, analysis, and maintenance of bridges and other structures. Since 2013, he has applied his expertise as structural engineer, business and functional analyst, and certified project manager and scrum master to oversee the development and deployment of, of asset management software solutions for large state-level agencies, including the Departments of Transportation of Georgia, New York, and Nevada. He holds a U.S. patent for nano-engineered structural joints and is a frequent contributor to national transportation engineering conferences and journals. Please welcome Mohammed Sayar. And I'll pass control over to you now. Thanks, Barry. Just a second, please. Okay. Are you able to grab the screen now? I'm not able to share my screen yet. Okay. Are you having problems, Mohammed? We don't see the screens yet. Yeah, I'm not able to share my screen, Barry. Okay, let me try that again. Sorry, everyone. Now it should go. Yeah, now it's better. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Thanks for attending this uh, webinar. My name is Mohammed, uh, and today we're going to review some um, something about Map 21 performance-based bridge management, the requirements, and how we can apply those concepts to get the most of return on investment uh, when we are managing bridges. Uh, we're going to have brief. Uh, review for non-US attendees about MAP21 FASTAG and performance-based bridge management. Then uh, we introduced the structure analyst tool, followed by a case study, and we wrap up the webinar by summary part. Okay, let's start with the definition of MAP21, moving ahead for progress in the 21st Century Act called MAP21 enacted in 2012, and it continued by FAST Act, Fixing and Measured Surface Transportation Act starting in 2016. The objective of both are a reform and transition to performance-based program, including establishing National Performance Goals for Federal Aid Highway Program. The FAST Act actually uh, supports and continues this overall performance, manage and performance management approach and requires states uh, to invest resources in projects that make progress toward those national goals. Uh, both MAP21 and FAST Act uh, include provisions to make federal uh, uh, federal surface transportation, more streamlined performance based and multimodal, and address the challenges that the U.S. transportation system is facing. And those challenges including uh, the safety, uh, so if you're trying to improve safety, um, maintaining and improving the condition of highway infrastructure assets, uh, like bridge and pavement, reducing traffic congestion, uh, improving efficiency of the system and freight movement, protecting environment, and finally reducing delays in project delivery. And um, in order to achieve these goals, uh, MAP21 and FAST Act uh, mandated states to use transportation performance process, uh, which is defined 
uh, as strategic approach that uses system information to make uh, uh, to make investment on policy decisions uh, to achieve national performance goals. So there are six components there, and all of these increase the effectiveness of a public fund investment and coordination of decision makers across different assets and dif uh, different program areas. There is a workflow that designed a performance-based planning uh, called performance-based planning programming. And it actually uh, contains and address four questions for us. Where to go, how to get there, and what did it take and how did we do uh, to achieve the goals? So starts with goals and objectives that these goals can be national goals or agency high level goals. Then for each goal, uh, agency needs to define performance measures corresponding to that goal. And then the target setting resource allocation and monitor and evaluation. Uh, takes place. So as part of the target setting and uh, evaluate different strategies, you need to identify the trend and targets and uh, evaluate and analyze different what if scenario to achieve um, each target for each goal. And eventually, if you are not, if um, based on uh, your performance, based on uh, the outcome of uh, planning, you may need to revisit the goals and objectives. So basically, it's more like uh, to, uh, for the agency to know that what, what is working and what is not working. And if something is not working, then go back and uh, check goals and objectives and fix that. So uh, as I said, uh, states are mandated, at least in the US, uh, States are mandated to follow this rule. Uh, so there are some requirements, MAP 21, FAST Act, and federal requirements to monitor, evaluate, and uh, report the progress. Let's see uh, the requirement in terms of reports. Uh, State DOT Department of Transportation must set target for each measure uh, for each program area. We are talking about context of bridge. So uh, for bridge, they need to, each agency need to submit different reports over a four year performance period. Uh, so four reports are required. The first one is the baseline performance report. So you need to know that what you are standing as of today and what is your two year target and full term target, which is four year target. You need to submit it. Uh, again, sorry, I'm uh, talking about US DOT. So US DOT need to submit these reports to FED. And basically, uh, th this is the timeline for those reports. And on October of 2018, 2020, and 2022, they need to uh, submit the, the initial is in, in October 20, 2018, a few weeks ago, and in October 2020 and 2022, they need to submit the progress report to see that how they achieve those targets. Uh, if they haven't achieved those targets, they, in the midterm, they have a chance to adjust the a goal for four year targets. So for example, in the uh, report that was due a few weeks ago, the initial report, uh, the content are baseline condition as of January 1st of 2018, and then followed by the targets for two year and targets for four year. Uh, the targets are uh, based on the percentage of the good bridges uh, and percentage of the poor bridges in the network for NHS bridges, national highway system. 
So let's see uh, how they are connected to how those measures are defined for bridges. In the US, um, we, are, we have a traditional rating system for bridges called MBR rating. Um, from zero to nine, zero means the bridge is actually collapsed and nine means the component is uh, excellent or brand new. Uh, there are some, uh, the bridges are, uh, have, bridges have uh, three components, the superstructure and substructure, and each component will be rated individually, separately, uh, from zero to nine. If the, if the component is rated seven or higher is considered as good, five or six considered as six is considered as fair, and if it's one to four, then it's considered poor. The overall bridge condition or classification will go with the worst condition. So, for example, if you have a bridge with thick rating as six, which is fair, superstructure as four, which is poor, uh, substructure of seven, which is good, the overall uh, classification for the bridge will be four and four. So uh, this is the, the measure defined in MAP21, and we need to use this when, I'm, when we are doing target setting and planning. And regardless what stage set the targets, uh, there is a minimum for uh, condition level for the network that states cannot exceed, and that is 10% of NHS bridges in poor condition. So uh, there is a calculation method to see uh, to calculate that percentage that's based on deck area, the total deck area of bridge classified as poor divided by uh, deck area of the total deck area of NHS bridges uh, is the percentage that shouldn't exceed 10%. And if the state cannot meet that requirement, then they need to set aside a part of the uh, National Highway Performance Program funds for only eligible uh, bridges or projects. So basically, um, states lose um, some flexibility of Spending funding. One thing that I want to mention here is you see that states will get penalized based on poor condition. So that may imply that poor condition or a performance measure of poor is more important. Uh, we will see that in the case study that if that's true or not. Okay, so let's see how investment strategy and performance measures are connected and related. Let's talk about investment strategy and priorities first. Um, in general, to address any issue or to manage anything, we, have, we can have two approaches, reactive or proactive. That's a common sense that proactive is better, uh, but for a long time, we have been practicing worst first uh, strategy to manage bridge assets in the US. That means that critical projects will always um, get priority over um, maybe non-critical projects and that actually in long term that lowers investment effectiveness. But for proactive uh, approach, we are trying to keep bridges in a state of good repair and we take early actions before an issue becomes critical or even um, the issue has been created. That's why we are doing preservation work or um, preventive maintenance work on bridges. So let's see how we can get a proactive approach uh, using those performance measures. In general, we have different treatment categories 
um, depending on your agency, you can define different categories, but uh, in general, we can define three categories, preservation or minor repairs, uh, major repair or rehab and replacement. I saw some states have uh, more than that. For example, New York has eight treatment categories. Uh, but let's uh, limit it to just these three and see how they are connected to uh, performance measures. Preservation or minor repairs, which are the low cost and more frequent uh, actions on the bridge, happens when the bridge is still in good or it's falling from good to fair condition. Then we have rehabilitation treatment that is fair, still bridge is in fair condition uh, and it's falling to poor. It's more expensive than preservation or minor repair. And the last one is when it's too late to fix the bridge and we have to uh, spend a lot of money um, and uh, replace the whole bridge because the bridge is already in poor condition. And the goal actually the, um, for the investment strategy um, the goal was to have more preservation work, uh, but uh, as a bridge engineer or uh, a bridge planner, I have three questions in general way. I have three questions that what's the minimum cost to achieve the goals or targets? Uh, the second question, what can I do with the current budget uh, or projected budget. And then the third question is the gap analysis that how much more money do you need to, to achieve your goals or how much you need to um, uh, sacrifice your goals and adjust your targets. So many of us or many of um, uh, high level managers um, need this gap analysis to go and ask for more money. But beyond that, there is one more uh, important question here, that what's the best strategy to set the targets? Questions like, uh, should I focus on poor or good bridges? Poor performance measures or good performance measures? How can I have more preservation over rehabilitation and replacement? And uh, another important thing, and actually I see that as a misleading, is uh, when we see the performance period uh, as four year, so should we go beyond that four year? Should the planning time horizon be longer than that? Uh, we all know that the bridges um, deteriorate uh, for longer time than four year or 10 year. Uh, so we'll see in the case of study that how it works. So to address that, uh, we have different uh, scenario that uh, it's translated to optimization problem. So you can have in the optimization problem, you can have multiple objectives of constraint. For example, you can have fixed or variable annual budget, but you want to maximize the performance based on that. Or uh, you have a target to limit your um, percentage of good or poor below or above the threshold and minimize the budget to achieve those goals. And the last one is the budget allocated by budget category, which means that, for example, some states have um, specific program for preservation and a certain allocated budget for that program. So you, you may want to um, define that in your analysis and uh, in your body scenarios. And for all of them, the output will be optimal set of projects. So that 
gives you the maximum or minimum uh, return on investment by meeting all of the constraints to define the system. So here's the tool that we use to address all of those questions. Um, first of all, this is not a sales uh, presentation, but uh, since we have some non-US um, attendees, I want to talk about Agile Assets Structure Analyst Tool because we have talked about the NBI rating, the US uh, rating system, those performance measures, and but our Agile Assets Structure Analyst goes beyond that. So it can do based on component level or more detailed um, uh, rating system like element level inspection system that is used in UK or uh, in Canada. Uh, so it can generate projects at that level and make better investment decisions for the projects at that level uh, and create the optimal um, uh, strategies and management work, work plans. So let's see how it works, the uh, components of structure analysis. It starts with inputs. Uh, inventory and condition data are stored in the system, and the system will use it if you are using a uh, structure inspector. It can be linked to that, or uh, it, it can use the inventory and condition data that is stored in the system itself. And then the second part is analysis that it generates a, a condition indexes for the inspection inventory data, then the decision uh, logic that you define and deterioration models in the system based on the what if scenario that you define with multi-constraint, uh, multi multi-year analysis, the optimization solver will solve and give the optimal work plan and projected uh, condition and budget based on those constraints. These are some uh, screenshots from the system that is the uh, uh, network master screen that we uh, store all of the um, inspection and inventory data there. This is a, one example of decision tree that you can incorporate different uh, attributes there. Like if you have different uh, decision tree logic based on material, based on location, based on traffic on the bridge, you can define all of that in the tree. This is a deterioration. Uh, and performance model that shows you how your bridges are uh, or components are being deteriorated for each model and it shows the predicted model and uh, the real deterioration so you can compare them and if needed the system can update that. And here is the place that we define the uh, what if scenarios. Um, this part let me, this part, yes. This part is actually the place that we define the scenarios and you can uh, define the length of the scenario or uh, if you have some projects that already should be part of the work plan, you can define them. If you wanna uh, run a subset of, uh, run the scenario for subset of um, network, you can do that. Also here, this is a place that I want to talk about, um, and it's related to performance measures. Actually, the performance measures uh, in our system is defined in a very flexible way that, um, for example, for in this scenario, my target is to have more than 60% of my network um, in good condition. But the good condition is defined, is very flexible. It means that the user can define uh, the threshold for good condition here. So for example, if in your agency, uh, you wanna define another classification for the component, um, like um, 
uh, if the bridge is uh, below two um, um, below rating two uh, considered as very poor, then you can do that easily here. Uh, and this part is the reporting function that you can um, define different um, criteria and different attributes here to get a quick result of those uh, um, based on those attributes in the report part. Yeah, and this is the uh, work plan generated uh, for each scenario uh, based on the detailed information. Again, uh, this is data and superstructure here based on component, but uh, the system can do that if uh, you want to do it at the element level. It can do that. Um, and this is the actually one of the quick report based on the parameters or uh, reporting function that you define during the during the um, analysis setup. Now let's get to the case study. In the case study, I used Georgia um, system, the inspection data from 2016. Uh, 15,000 structures, both NHS and non-NHS non bridges, and the time horizon is 10 years. Uh, it's uh, beyond the five year that was mentioned during the performance uh, period. The scenario one is minimize the cost, uh, but the target is keep the network uh, under 2% classified as poor, but no constraint on good. Okay. The second scenario is the minimized cost, the same 2% for the poor, but now I added a, a constraint for good. And the last one is, again, minimized cost, 2% uh, um, in good, and 62% in good. Um, so if you see them, all of them have the same um, uh, constraint as poor, but the good is something that is different on the constraint. Um, so comparing scenario one and two uh, will tell us that what's the effect of introducing and adding constraint on performance measure good. and comparison between two and three uh, will tell us that if we increase the percentage of good, how it uh, affects the results. This is the result for uh, the percentage of four for each year. So scenario one, uh, where we had 2% uh, for poor, but uh, no constraint on good, scenario two, and scenario three. And the system works in a way that if the percentage of um, each scenario uh, goes beyond the constraint, then the system generates optimal projects uh, to lower that um, uh, uh, condition within the constraint. So for example, in 2023, the project, the optimal project will be generated to uh, achieve the target of 2% for all of the uh, scenarios. The same thing for good condition before treatment applies. Uh, in scenario one, we did not have the uh, constraint on good. So you see that in scenario one, the scenario one, you see that the we have a almost trend of continuous decrease in the percentage of good. But in scenario two and three, we have a better condition for uh, the uh, percentage of bridges in good condition. And if the uh, scenario gives us the, uh, if, it be, if it falls below the uh, constraint, the system will generate the uh, project optimal project to achieve and raise the condition to the target. 
So for example, in 2021, uh, this project will be generated for scenario one, scenario, sorry, scenario two and scenario three. Here is the long-term network performance uh, condition uh, that in scenario one, we have 2% uh, in poor, which is what we defined, and only 7% remaining in good condition. So most of the network is in fair condition. In scenario two and three, we have uh, what we defined actually. So the constraint was 62% in good condition and 2% uh, uh, poor condition for scenario three. So the remaining would be in fair condition and that's what we expected to see. So in general, scenario three is the best uh, performance. It has the best long-term uh, performance among these three. So let's see how much it costs uh, for each um, scenario. Let's scenario one. The scenario one, we have uh, almost nothing spent or cost in the early stage, in the beginning of the scenario, because the uh, initial condition of the network was pretty good. So not much or not many projects uh, was needed for that. But eventually, we had a, a more projects and more costs associated with that. Scenario three and scenario, scenario two and scenario three both have some initial costs and then, uh, but the, scenario, the costs are more distributed or um, not uniformly, but uh, it's we don't have that jump of cost in scenario two and scenario three compared to scenario one. But the total, if you look at the total cost, you see that the total cost of scenario one is much higher than scenario two and scenario three. And when we compare the scenario two and three, we see that the scenario two is still, uh, uh, it has more cost compared to scenario three. So, that's kind of uh, uh, it against our expectation, maybe, because the scenario one uh, gave us the worst network condition, and now we are seeing that it has the highest total cost. Now let's see uh, the cumulative cost over, um, over the analysis period. For the first five years, we are seeing the scenario one has the lowest cost and scenario three has the highest cost. But when we look at the 10 year scenario, 10 year analysis period, we are seeing that the scenario one has the highest cost as we saw the total cost in the previous slide and around 2023, 2024, you're seeing that the cumulative cost of scenario one will exceed uh, that of scenario two and three. So if I wanted to consider uh, and run the, uh, my analysis for five years, I would have um, um, chosen uh, scenario one over scenario two and three. But when we uh, have a long enough scenario or one long enough analysis period, then the results will be changed. And someone may argue that, okay, you are spending these costs over time, not at the same time, so just comparing the total costs is uh, not uh, making sense. Uh, so this is a calculated uh, value for present value of um, those costs still you're seeing that the total cost for scenario one is almost 50% uh, higher than scenario two and scenario three. And still scenario three has the lowest cost compared to scenario two and scenario one. So even uh, when we introduce a higher, uh, when we set higher 
uh, value for good uh, performance measurement scenario three. It gave us uh, the lowest cost, long term lowest cost. So, what's the reason behind that? Let's look at the distribution of treatments. Um, for the preservation, that we saw that the preservation is the lowest cost treatments uh, and is more aligned with proactive um, uh, strategy. Uh, we have this kind of treatment like three times of scenario one when we are seeing in scenario three. Uh, but when we look at the other more expensive treatments, especially for replacement, we are seeing the uh, minimum number of replacement projects are related to uh, scenario three, while we have double of that number in scenario one. So by, by taking early stage and uh, 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 low cost treatments, in scenario three, you will have a better condition, network condition, long-term network condition, while we have lower um, and high cost treatments for replacement projects. So the summary, uh, the system agile asset structure and the school can um, use those uh, the uh, specified in MAP21 and FASTAC and establish the uh, performance measure, performance targets in the scenario. You can um, use the optimization analysis to uh, run different what if scenarios and set up the objectives or constraints based on uh, the uh, targets or uh, different criteria that you have, like uh, uh, budget category uh, uh, or almost anything that you have for uh, in your agency. And uh, you can compare different scenarios to see that what makes more sense and what works and what doesn't work. Uh, in the scenario that I mentioned, uh, for some of them, or for some years, we didn't have the uh, good distribution of funds. So uh, more scenarios should be run using this tool and uh, to actually limit the budget that you're going to spend for each asset for each year. Uh, so that's something that uh, we need to do. Uh, compliance with... Uh, MAP21 and FASTAG performance period um, doesn't guarantee that you get the best of uh, ROI uh, for your network. We saw that the five-year analysis could give us the wrong answer. Um, bridge um, asset management is not an overnight practice. We all know that bridges deteriorate um, uh, some components in bridge is actually deteriorates like 20 or 30 years. Uh, and by a running scenario for five years or even 10 years, we cannot see uh, the full picture of that. So um, go beyond that uh, performance period and run analysis for uh, at least 15, 20 years. And the last one is the Focusing on uh, performance measures classified as good uh, triggers more preservation works and more frequent uh, treatments of the bridge, and eventually it yields to lower long-term uh, program cost. So that's something that is against. Um, I'm not saying against, but uh, something that. Uh, when we are reading the penalty and the penalty that if you're not meeting the targets uh, of MAP21, that states get penalized against poor condition. So you may take, you may care more about poor condition over good condition, but we saw that the uh, performance uh, measure of good 
is more important than um, that of poor, performance measure poor. And if there is any question, uh, please put in the Q&A panel. Barry? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, everybody, if you can put, it, put your questions in the Q&A panel, we'll get to them uh, with the time remaining. Um, here's one question. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase it. How does the Agile Assets solution apply to other countries with different regulations or other guidelines? I think you mentioned that earlier, but could you uh, reiterate that, please? Yes. So there are two things. One is the um, inspection rating system uh, that actually our solution uh, is using the in the um, in the engine is using uh, any rating system into condition index. So it means that any rating system can be imported to the system, and the system uh, can take care of all of the. I mean, all of the models can be applied to any rating system. That's about the rating system. So when we are tar uh, talking about the performance measures, uh, the system is highly configurable and highly flexible. Um, the performance measure itself is, um, is applicable to any range of that rating system. I mean, I mentioned that if, for example, you have different uh, uh, classification for poor or fair or good, you can do that uh, within the current system. But uh, uh, any other uh, attributes can be easily added even by the user to the system, admin user to the system, and the system can handle all of that. In addition to that, I mentioned that um, our system can do at both component level and element level, meaning that if you are doing quantitative rating system, for example, in the US, uh, we have started collecting element inspection data starting in 2014, and that's based on each element. For each element, we have four condition states from uh, condition state one to four, and then inspectors put uh, the quantity in each condition state. So we have much more detailed um, information there, more elements, more inspection data, but all of them uh, can be used and will be handled um, in, in structure inspector, in, sorry, in structure analyst tool. So actually it, it works at both component and element level. Okay. Thank you. Here's another question. It's actually not a question, but I'll make it a question. I think the key of all of this is how precisely do you model the deterioration? It's kind of a, it's kind of a statement, but it is, it's also a question. It, it, uh, does the tool um, precisely, how precisely does the tool model deterioration? Okay. So there are two things about that. One is um, deterioration models for each uh, state and for each location is different from another one. So that should be defined um, by the agency. Uh, but the system has capability to, if you have enough historical information, it can show you the um, historical data, and it can uh, uh, match a model or suggest a model for that one, for, for the historical information. So it, it depends on how much and how many and how long historical information you have. If you have more information, then it can give you better results. Um, and another thing is um, the system can do different uh, deterioration models based on different par parameters. 
Um, for example, if you have different deterioration for ADT, for uh, um, traffic or for location uh, or for age, material, anything, you can define all of that and you can associate uh, separate and specific deterioration models for each category. Okay. Uh, next question, what is the best or preferred method for using the BMS system to optimize benefit on choosing projects? Sorry, can you repeat it again? What is the preferred method for using the system, uh, the BMS system, to optimize benefit in choosing product projects? Okay, so um, first of all, I, uh, this presentation showed that if you focus on um, good or um, if you are trying to keep the network in a state of good repair, you will get a better long-term results. Uh, to answer that, um, I would say that um, you can use different um, budget categories. And uh, first of all, um, you, you should run the scenario and uh, without any funding limit to see that if you have unlimited budget, what is the, uh, uh, what does it cost to achieve uh, your target? Then the second one is the, uh, based on the project, that, uh, cost, projected budget, you find the best, um, or uh, you find the best performance index. Here, when you are doing this scenario, I suggest that the performance measure would be the percentage of bridges in good condition. You know that when you are doing optimization scenario and optimization analysis, you can have just one function or one attribute to be maximized or minimized. Okay. So if you have an available budget, you cannot uh, have both uh, a percentage of good bridges maximized and percentage of poor bridges minimized. Okay. So that's uh, based on the case study that I showed that if you are trying to do this scenario, you need to put the uh, target on percentage of network in good condition and try to maximize that. Still, you need to limit the percentage of network in poor, but use it as a constraint. Okay. Uh, another question, does the system also provide a tool to manage bridge asset inventories? Yes. The uh, actually, um, the system, the bridge analyst tool, works as a standalone system or in conjunction with uh, uh, other tools. One of them is uh, Structure Inspector. So Structure Inspector uh, used to uh, collect inventory and inspection data uh, for structure assets in general and then it can be connected to the uh, structure analyst and seamlessly um, structure analysts will use those data. And in addition to that, there are other uh, tools like uh, maintenance management system that can be integrated to structure analysts uh, and the project can be uh, sent over to uh, MMS system. Um, in addition to these two, we have pavement analysts. Uh, and if you have both uh, structure analysts and pavement analysts, actually, then you can use another tool called portfolio analyst. And portfolio analyst is actually what uh, uh, is needed based on MAP21 and FASTAC, that you are doing managing cross assets uh, and you can actually allocate assets cross, uh, allocate funding cross assets, cross bridge to pavement, 
and uh, you have one tool to manage both. Uh, so these are all <laughs> related uh, products to structure analysis. Okay, uh, we have a few minutes left. Uh, another question, do users need to input all costs related to preservation, repair, rehab, and replacement to obtain the output, or are they embedded in by default? Okay, actually that's, the, uh, that's um, depending uh, on how you want to define scenario. The short answer is no. If you have a total cost, total budget, you can define it. If you have separate programs in your agency and each has its own budget, you can define it as well. Um, for example, for uh, one state that we are talking um, in preservation conference uh, last year, one agency mentioned that they have 30% for preservation work it's 30% of the budget, the department budget goes to preservation work, but they want to increase it to 50%. So that's actually additional tool for them to specify the, the detailed level of um, budget for each category. But nope, you can define that as a lump. Uh, and based on the treatment, Okay, and another thing is in the treatment definition in the system, each treatment is associated to a budget category. So if you have a just lump sum for your budget, then based on the recommended treatments, the system will tell you that how much of that is in uh, which category, uh, which budget category. So it calculates it for you. Okay, uh, still a, another question. Do you have some suggestions for how to detect when a particular treatment is not working? I see how you went from no treatment to applying a particular treatment, but do you have suggestions for treatment or scenario correction when you're in the middle of the program? Yes, there are two things here. When you see the uh, work plan, when the scenario generates work plan, you can modify that, you can go and change that work plan and maybe adjust the price, maybe you can add um, different treatment or change treatment uh, and revise the scenario and um, tell the system to recalculate the scenario based on the modification that you made in the system. So then the system will calculate the projected condition and cost based on the treatment and based on the updated that you make. If you are in middle of the program, uh, same thing can be applied. Uh, or we have another thing that life cycle cost analysis that, that works at uh, asset level or group of assets. And then it tells you that if you miss one treatment, if, or if you want to replace one treatment with another, then uh, what's the impact of that change over the life cycle of that asset or that those group of assets? Um, that's two things that can address can be used for this. Okay, um, final question, because we're running out of time. Can you provide names of the states, and I'll also say countries, if, if it applies, that are using your system? Uh, yes, uh, we have um, some states in the U.S. Uh, we have M21 in London. Uh, we have Israel, uh, we have uh, structure analysts and uh, I mean the whole system in Israel and we have, I think we just implemented that in Indonesia. What about in the U.S.? Oh, in the U.S., uh, we have a system for Georgia, for North Carolina, NISDOT, 
New York State, and we are developing that for Nevada. Okay. We are out of time. There, uh, there's one question that I'll answer as I'm concluding, which is, would you share the PowerPoint slides? And yes, um, we will send a, a link, uh, an email to you with a, a link to the recording of this webinar as well as a download of the PowerPoint presentation um, next week. So with that, I want to thank everybody for joining today, and please take a moment as you exit the webinar to answer the very short survey to help us improve these webinars going forward. Thank you, and have a good morning, rest of day, evening, and we will see you at the next webinar. Thank you.